So welcome to this second part of the lecture series on the anatomy of the digestive system, where in this part we are going to look at anatomy of the small intestine as well as anatomy of the large intestine. If you remember well, in the first part of the lecture series, we talked about general concepts regarding digestive system anatomy. And we also looked at anatomy of the upper JT, where we focused on anatomy of the mouth, the pharynx, esophagus, and the stomach. So in this second part, we are going to look at anatomy of the small intestine as well as anatomy of the large intestine. There are still other series that are yet to come where we'll be looking at the extrinsic organs of the digestive system as well as development and malformations of the digestive system. So in this particular lecture, this will be our learning outcome. First, we'll review the components of the whole OJT in a proximal distal manner, which means from the mouth all the way to the endocanal canal that you already know from the previous lecture. We're also going to review the histological layers of the gut wall. Again, that one you already know. So importantly, we are going to look at the segments of the small intestine and also look at this, the structure organization functions and blood supply of the small intestine. So that will form a bigger part of our lecture today. After that, we are also going to focus on the large intestine where we are also going to look at the structure organization functions and blood supply of the large intestine. Then we will take a slight detour and uh, talk about different segments of the intestines and how we can identify them histologically. So I'll be giving you some histological slides of different segments of the intestines, whether small or large. And we will be using some characteristics that we laid down in the previous class so that we're able to identify them. I'll repeat for you those characteristics though. Lastly, we are going to describe this planktic circulation. And then we are going to highlight on protocaval anastomosis and its significance. So starting with the first agenda, the components of the whole JT in a proximal distal manner, we did this in the previous class. We know that uh, food enters the mouth, then goes to the pharynx, esophagus, then stomach from there, food goes to the small intestine, which consists of uh, duodenum, jejunum, and ileum in that order then food goes to the large intestine, in which case we'll be talking about the cecum, the colon, the rectum, and enocanal in that order. In that list, we also have the appendix, but food does not go to, through the appendix. So basically, those are the parts of the alimentary canal in order from above, downward to from proximal to distal aspect. Remember also along the path of the JT, we have various sphincters. The one between the pharynx and the esophagus is called the upper esophagus sphincter being formed by the cricopharyngeus muscle. The lower esophagus sphincter, also called cardiac sphincter, is the one between esophagus and the stomach. Pyloric sphincter is between the stomach and the duodenum. The sphincter of Odi is not really part of the alimentary canal sphincters per se, but uh, it is a sphincter that control entry from the liver and pancreas into the alimentary canal. It's a sphincter that control the emptying of bile and pancreatic juice into the duodenum. But yes, we have the ileocecal valve which control entry to the large gut, or perhaps more accurately put, the lesical valve prevents reflux of material from the large intestine into the small intestine. Internal enosphincter and external enosphincter are both sphincters in the anal 
region, the internal being formed by smooth muscle, so it is involuntary. The external being formed by, ex, by skeletal muscle, and therefore it is voluntary. Okay, so those we did last time, we just reviewed them. Histologically, the gut wall consists of four histological layers. The innermost layer called the mucosa or the mucosal layer consists of lining epithelium, lamina propria, and muscularis mucosa. The second layer submucosa consists of dense irregular connective tissue. It may or may not have some glands. The muscular layer is the, out, the third layer consisting of inner circular muscle and outer longitudinal muscle or inner circular layer of smooth muscles and outer longitudinal layer of smooth muscles in most parts of the alimentary canal, but there are a few exceptions. And then we have the outermost layer formed by what you call adventitia or serosa, depending on whether it has peritoneal lining or not. So these are the histological layers. I hope you remember the specific details about each layer from the previous class. We are going to use that concept in today's class when you're going to practically identify the histological segments of the GIT. So this image captures for you the innermost layer, mucosa, the submucosa, muscular layer, and adventitia. Remember also that there are two nerve plexuses within the wall of the GIT, the submucosal nerve plexus, located within the submucosa control secretions and my enteric nerve plexus located within the muscular layer control contractions. So I think that's a good recap. Now we can focus on the actual agenda of today's session. Small intestines. When you talk of the small intestine, we are referring to three structures the duodenum, jejunum, and the ileum in that order. So it extends from the pyloric sphincter all the way to the ileocecal valve. The junction between ileum and the cecum is the ileocecal valve. The pyloric sphincter is from is the junction between stomach and the duodenum. So those are the extents of the small intestine. We are aware that it's highly coiled so that it can fit that small space. However, if you were to stretch the small intestine, it would be about five meters in length. Well, it can range from three meters to seven meters in an adult. Out of the three, duodenum is largely retroperitoneal, which means that uh, it is not fully embraced by the visceral peritoneum. It is just lined by peritoneum on the anterior aspect. Otherwise, it is between the peritoneum and the posterior abdominal wall. So it is retroperitoneal. And it extends from the pyloric sphincter to the junction between the duodenum and the jejunum what we call the duodenal jejunal junction. The other two segments of the small intestine are intraperitoneal. And commonly, those are the ones we refer to as the small bowel. So when you use the term small bowel, we tend to exclude the duodenum and just include the jejunum and the ileum. So remember the small bowel is intraperitoneal, made up of jejunum and the ilia. One of the unique features of the small intestine, irrespective of the region, is the presence of some finger-like projections into the lumen of the intestine. These finger-like projections are the ones we call the villi. 
So I hope you can see in that slide, the villi of the small intestine, these finger-like projections, they're macroscopic, you can see them. Very long, very many. The aim of these projections is to increase the surface area of the small intestine because of its various functions. Now, if you are to look at the cell types that line the small intestine, the epithelial lining of the small intestine, we are going to get some important aspects that also allude to as the functions of the small intestine. So the image shown to you here on the left shows you a villus, which is that one, and another one there. And we see epithelium lining the villus. Now, there are a number of cell types that will line the villus on that epithelium. Between adjacent villi, you have a depression. And these depressions are the ones we call the crypts of Libacun. The crypts of Libacun are present both in the small intestine as well as the large intestine. However, the villi are not present in the large intestine. They are unique to the small intestine. And so that's one of the things that make them stand out, the presence of the villi. I want us to state some of the cell types that line the villus portion of the epithelium. Then we're also going to state the cell types that line the cryptal portion of the epithelium. So the most abundant of the cell types that line the villi are called enterocytes. Enterocytes are basically columnar cells with microvilli. Now microvilli are different from villi. Villi are this finger-like projections, which are macroscopic. Now, you notice that uh, the villi are lined by numerous cells. If you are to take an individual cell there and put it there, then you see these other finger-like projections from the apical cell membrane of each cell. These are the ones we call microvilli. So we have villi, yes, and we also have microvilli. A light microscope is not able to resolve a microvillus, but microvilli are usually compact, very close together. And so in light microscopy, it appears like uh, some two lines running parallel appear like a brush border, and that is why we call it the brush border. So when you use the term brush border, it is just the light microscopic appearance of the microvilli. Because of the presence of the microvilli, this is an adaptation for absorption. So enterocytes are largely absorptive cells. This image captures for you the enterocytes and their microvilli, as you can see in that particular image. So these are the microvilli, these are the enterocytes which line here but that big thing is a villus, and this is the crypt of Libacun. The second most abundant cell type, well, maybe not most abundant, but still present within the lining of the villus epithelium are the goblet cells. Goblet cells produce mucus. The function of the mucus is basically to protect the lining. But this protection could be just physical protection to prevent against friction, which means it lubricates the intestinal lining. Apart from lubrication, there are some components of this secretion that actually contain chemicals which can fight infections. So they are antibacterial, they have antibacterial properties. Again, because of the presence of the mucus, it forms a protection against toxins. 
So toxins cannot diffuse easily through the mucus barrier. All of them are protective function, protection against physical injury, protection against toxins, and protection against invasion by microorganisms. So if this is the villus, these are the goblet cells. Well, goblet cells are present both on the villa side as well as on the crypt side, as you see in this image. These are the ones at the enterocytes, which are the most abundant of the cell types. Then you have what you call the microfold cells. Microfold cells, or others known as the M cells, are found where the epithelium of the intestine covers a mucosa associated lymphatic tissue or gut associated lymphatic tissue. So in those regions, which look like this, so if this is mucosa associated lymphatic tissue, the ones in the ileum are generally called the pear patches. If that is malt, we usually have some M cells over that, those regions. The function of the M cells is basically to process the antigens and present them to the lymphocytes which are within the pears patches or may even hover around the microfold cells themselves. So they are antigen processing and presenting cells. They are cells of the immune system. Lastly, we have the intraepithelial lymphocytes. These are lymphocytes which are within the epithelial lining. Of course, just like uh, any other lymphocytes that are for immunological functions, these cells may have migrated from the underlying mucosa associated lymphatic tissue or gut associated lymphatic tissue. They are cells of the immune system. So those are the different cell types which are found on the epithelial lining of the villus portion. Now I want us to talk about the crypts of Libacun and the cells that line them. The intestinal crypts of Libacun are tubular glands. So that is the gland we're talking about. It's a tubular gland that open into the lumen of the alimentary canal lumen of the intestine between the bases of the villi in the small intestine. In the large intestine, we don't have the villi per se, so they just open onto the surface directly. One difference between the crypts of Libacun of the small intestine compared to those ones of the large intestine is that the ones of the small intestine are shorter. The ones of the large intestine are, are longer, deep, and perhaps very close together the ones of the small intestine are shorter and slightly spaced, and it makes sense because of the villi. There are a number of cell types which line the crypts of Libacun. Enterocytes are still the most abundant of the cell types that line the crypts of Libacun. However, the enterocytes which line the crypts have a different function from the enterocytes that are on the villus portion. The enterocytes that line the crypts are known to secrete ions and alkaline fluid that help to dilute chyme. Now, remember that uh, they are around this region. So they secrete some ions and alkaline media that will be diluting chyme. Remember the food from the stomach is acidic because of the gastric acid. So the secretions of enterocytes help to dilute chyme. Importantly also, they produce water. That water is secretion, they release so that when that reaches here, the enterocytes on the villus portion will absorb the water together with the nutrients. And that's the mechanism they're using to aid in absorption. So understand that the small intestine will be secreting water at this point, but absorbing it at that point. So that water is recycled here. Water is recycled here. 
but through that recycling of water, nutrients are absorbed by the enterocytes of the villus portion. Think about in the intestines, if the villi were not there, therefore, what will happen? It means that the enterocytes on this point will actually be secreting the water, but uh, that water cannot be absorbed. That is why if you have something that destroys the villi, expect some degree of diarrhea. The second cell type of the crypts of Libacun are the mucus cells, which are similar to the goblet cells of the villus portion with similar functions, not a big deal. Then we have the panet cells. Panet cells are cells of the immune system as well. Their key function is to produce some chemical substances which help to kill bacteria. So there are some enzymes like lysozyme and others which are secreted by the panet cells. And these secretions are basically antibacterial. We have what we call the enteroendocrine cells, which are also known as the neuroendocrine cells. The enteroendocrine cells, or otherwise known as neuroendocrine cells, are cells which secrete bioactive peptides. These bioactive peptides are chemical messengers in simple terms. They are released in a paracrine fashion, but they also find themselves in the bloodstream. And that is why they're also hormonal. So examples of such secretions include gastrin, cholecystokinin, secretin, we are going to look at them. But basically cells which produce hormonal substances fall under this category of the enteroendocrine cells. Because they're likely stimulated by the nervous system, we can also call them neuroendocrine cells. Lastly, we have the stem cells. The stem cells are the cells which give rise to the other cell types. So there are many stem cells basically around this region. They may be classified based on where they are found. So we have the crypt-based columnar stem cells, which are the most primitive of them all at the base of the epithelium, actively dividing. But we also have the intestinal stem cell, which is slightly migrated a bit from the base. And then we have this one, the transit amplifying cell. It's still part of the stem cell morphology, but it has advanced a bit. So those are the different types of stem cells which are found at the crypts of Libacun. I'll repeat them. The crypt-based columnar stem cells, the intestinal stem cell, and the transit amplifying cell in that order of differentiation. And from there, they give you the other cell types as you can see, even in that flowchart. They are the ones that give you enterocytes, goblet cells, neuroendocrine cells, and the panic cells. So basically, important to note that uh, the enterocytes are highly regenerative and they are replaced at a very high rate. The lifespan being maybe seven days, five to seven days. So every seven days, every one week, the enterocytes along the wall of your JT are actually new. That's what you're saying. The cells are highly regenerative, replaced at a very high rate. That's a protective mechanism as well for the body. And that is why it's important. Great, so those are some histological characteristics of the small intestine. But let's look at uh, the different segments of the small intestine. Let's start with the duodenum. The duodenum is C-shaped. It lies in the level of the first to the third lumbar vertebrae. So the upper part here will be at the level of the first lumbar vertebra, 
and the lower part there, the level, the third lumbar vertebra. And so perhaps the second lumbar vertebra lies around this region. And uh, that curvature of the duodenum is largely around the head of the pancreas. It is the widest part of the small intestine and measures about uh, a fifth to a quarter of a meter in adults. The proximal part of the duodenum is a bit unique because that proximal part is intraperitoneal. That proximal part is commonly known as the duodenal cup. It is intraperitoneal. Usually that proximal part also lack the normal folds that the small intestine usually have, which you're going to see, or in that image, you can see them. So that proximal part is uh, relatively smooth, or we can say it's featureless, but the other parts have a lot of circular folds, as you can see. So the duodenal cup refers to the proximal portion of the duodenum that is featureless and is intraperitoneal. That part usually balloon out during imaging and it appears like a cup, basically. We divide duodenum into four segments. We talk of first, second, third, and fourth segment. Or you can call them D1, D2, D3, and D4. So D1 is a part of the duodenum that leaves the pyloric region to go upwards. And so we can call it the superior part of the duodenum. That superior part of the duodenum is the one that contains the duodenal cup. But uh, it goes beyond the duodenal cup. So there's still part of the superior part of the duodenum, which is not part of the duodenal cup. The duodenal cup is just the proximal portion of the superior part of the duodenum. It's just the proximal portion of D1. So anyway, that's the superior part that goes up, maybe from around there. And then we have what you call the D2. The D2 is the descending part of the duodenum. The second part of the duodenum is called the D2, the descending segment. As you can see, the descending segment is going downwards. What is unique about the descending segment of the duodenum is that it contains opening of the ampulla of vata. Or let me put it this way. The D2 segment has two openings. We have what we call the major duodenal papilla, which is the ampulla of vata. And you have the minor duodenal papilla. The minor duodenal papilla is inconsistent. It is a variant one to mean that's not present in everyone, but when present, it contains the opening of the minor pancreatic duct, the opening of the minor pancreatic duct. That is the one we call the duct of Wilson. Then the major duodenal papilla or the ampulla of vata is the one that contains the opening of the major pancreatic duct. And uh, it also contains the opening of the common bile duct. So the common bile duct and the major pancreatic duct open together at the major duodenal papilla. Remember, the minor pancreatic duct, also known as the duct of Santorini, the minor pancreatic duct opens at the minor duodenal papilla, while the major pancreatic duct open together with the common bile duct at the major duodenal papilla. The major pancreatic duct is what we are calling the duct of Wilson. I think I might have uh, interchanged that. So take note, the major pancreatic duct is the duct of Wilson, and the minor pancreatic duct is the duct of Santorini. Okay, so this is the D2. 
So D2 will ex extend from the level of L1 vertebra to the level of L3 vertebra. And then we have the D3. The D3 is this segment here that is running transversely. We call it the horizontal part or the inferior part or the third part of the duodenum, D3. This one is the part of the duodenum that crosses the midline. So it will cross the midline from the right to the left side. And because it will be taking the curvature of the lumbar spine, the D3 is convex anteriorly, although we don't see it, but convex anteriorly because it takes the curvature of the lumbar spine. And then we have the D4. So D4 is this segment here, the part of the duodenum that goes up because it's going up, we call it the ascending segment or the fourth segment. So all those segments are retroperitoneal, but at the junction between D4 and jejunum, we now have a peritoneum lining the jejunum. So remember jejunum is intraperitoneal. At that point, therefore, there is the free margin of the peritoneum that is at that junction there. The free margin of the peritoneum that is at that junction is known as the suspensory ligament of trays. The suspensory ligament of trays is what is usually used to divide the GIT into the upper GIT and lower GIT. Remember I told you that when you talk of upper GIT, the duodenum is actually part of the upper GIT, but we chose to discuss it here because of its common characteristics with the small bowel. And yes, it is part of the small intestine. So that's why I'm discussing this particular lecture. But when you talk of upper GIT, the duodenum is part of the upper GIT. So the ligament of trays is around this point of the duodenal jejunal junction. And that is the junction between upper GIT and lower GIT. I've already mentioned about the fact that the second part of the duodenum contains the openings of the pancreatic ducts, the major and the minor duodenal papilla. Now let's say something about the small bowel, jejunum and the ileum. The jejunum and the ileum occupy the central region of the abdomen. They also occupy the lower parts of the abdomen. And basically they lie within the boundary of the large intestine. You see, we have this small bowel central and the large bowel peripheral. That's one of the features we use to distinguish between the small bowel and the large bowel. Generally, the small bowel is attached to the posterior abdomen wall using mesentery, which means that the small intestine is suspended by the mesentery. And because of the suspension by the mesentery, the small bowel is largely mobile. You can move the intestines from one corner to another. They can move because of the suspension, the mesentery. This is what we are calling the mesentery. The mesentery is a double layer of the visceral peritoneum. So the visceral peritoneum come and uh, cover the intestine and go back on itself. So forming that membrane, which you call the mesentery. Usually the mesentery has a number of functions. One of them being that is the path that will be followed by blood vessels, lymphatics, nerves, and uh, basically it also has some antibacterial properties and uh, anticoagulant properties in some situations. Now get it that the presence of the mesentery makes a region of an organ be intraperitoneal. So if an organ has a mesentery, that organ is considered intraperitoneal. And if an organ does not have a mesentery, that organ is considered 
extraperitoneal. So the small bowel is interperitoneal. The duodenum was largely extraperitoneal or retroperitoneal because it doesn't have a mesentery. The press of a mesentery makes a part of the JT become mobile. So this still shows you the mesentery of the small bowel and how the blood vessels will be running through it. Well, the small bowel is not the only segment that has mesentery. We also see the mesentery of the transverse colon there, which we call transverse mesocolon. That's a mesentery of the sigmoid colon, which we call the sigmoid mesocolon. So this is just the small bowel mesentery. The distal 30 centimeter of the ilium is often referred to as the terminal ilium. And this is because it has some specialized physiological functions largely to do with the absorption of substances. So when you say term, the term terminal ilium, you just refer to the distal 30 centimeter of the ilium. It's not the whole ilium. Right. I want us to state some differences between the jejunal segment and the ileal segment of the small bowel. Let's start with the length. In terms of length, jejunum is shorter than the ileum. The proximal two third, sorry, two fifths of the small bowel is the one occupied by jejunum, and the distal. Three over five of the small bowel is the one occupied by the ilium. So in terms of length, the ilium is long. However, we don't have a sharp transition between jejunum and ilium. There's no sharp transition, it's a gradual transition. In terms of location, jejunum occupies largely the upper left infracolic region of the abdomen. So that will be corresponding to the left lumbar region and uh, perhaps towards the left hypochondrium, but also coming to the umbilicus on the upper part, the upper part of the umbilical region. The infracolic region is the region below the attachment of the transverse mesocolon. So that is usually the region just below the pancreas. But now remember we're saying it is on the left side. So the left, we can put it simple and say that the jejunum is located in the left upper quadrant, but also extends towards the umbilical region of the abdomen if you think about the nine regions. How about the ilium? The ilium is largely in the hypogastrium as well as in the left iliac fossa. So it occupies more of the lower right quadrant. In terms of diameter, usually the jejunum is wider than the ilium, both in external diameter as well as in internal diameter. In terms of the thickness of the wall, jejunum is thicker than the ilium. This is largely because of the presence of long villi projection, which are present in the jejunum. The villi of the jejunum are longer. And so that makes the wall become relatively thick. If you look at the arterial supply of the two segments, the arteries are extensive. There are several arteries in the jejunum. And that makes jejunum appear red on live specimens, um, intraoperation, what, that's what I mean. If you look at jejunum in theater, it appears redder, deep red. The arterial supply of the ilium is not that extensive. I'm not saying it's not much. But if you compare the one of the jejunum, it is less extensive. 
and that makes the ilium appear pale pink on living specimens. Now the arteries that go to the intestines run within the mesentery. I've already told you that one. They usually form some arcades and the multiple rows of arcades of arteries I'm going to show you in an image in the next slide. When you look at these arcades, they're basically joining of arteries before they give some long branches which go to the segment being supplied. An image would do, you're going to see it in the next one. So those long arteries which come from the arcades are called the vasa rectum. When you compare the arcades of the small bowel, we note that uh, jejunum has one to two rows of the arterial arcades and long vasa recti, while ilium has four to five rows of the arterial arcades and shorter vasa recti. If you look at the amount of fat that is within the mesentery, the amount of fat that is within the mesentery of the jejunum is scanty. And that makes the mesentery of the jejunum relatively translucent. You can almost see through. Well, that will be transparent. Translucent means that light can pass through, but you can't see through. So the mesentery of the jejunum is translucent. We call those ones mesenteric windows. So Jejunum has mesenteric windows, or you can call them peritoneal windows. These are translucencies between the vasa recti in the mesentery of the jejunum. Ilium has very thick fat so that you can't even, light cannot pass through the mesentery, even between the vasa recta. And so we say ilium does not have peritoneal windows or mesenteric windows. How about the plica circularis? The plica circularis are those folds that we saw even in the duodenum, those circular folds, we call them the plica circularis. The plica circularis are large, tall, and densely packed in the jejunum. And the opposite is true for the plica circularis of the ilium. Lastly, we can compare the lymphoid aggregations which are present in both segments of the small bowel. The lymphoid aggregations which are in the jejunum are fewer, smaller, and you are not able to palpate them. They're microscopic largely. The ones of the ilium are numerous, larger, and they're palpable. They're the ones we call the pears patches. So remember these lymphoid aggregations are basically part of what we call the mucosa associated lymphatic tissue. And largely these ones form nodules, so we call them lymphatic nodules. So those lymphatic nodules are fewer, smaller and impalpable in jejunum, numerous, larger and palpable in the ilium. And those are the ones we call the pear patches, very prominent. This image, I'm using it to pick a number of differences between this jejunum and ilium. And I want us to understand the concept of the arterial arcades. So when blood vessels come to the mesent through the mesentery to supply the bowel, in the first image for jejunum, we see that artery there. So we have some arteries that go, but we can see the connections between them. These are the ones we are calling the arterial arcades. In the jejunum, there are about one to two arterial arcades. And then the arteries which come from the arcades are the ones we call the vasa recti, very long vasa recti for the jejunum. They'll be fat within this peritoneum, but the fat of the jejunum is scanty, so you can see through, or basically see in quotes, light can pass through. And so we say that there are peritoneal windows present. Remember the wall of the jejunum is thicker and the lumen is also wider compared to the one of the ilium. The lymphatic nodules for the jejunum are smaller compared to those ones of the ilium which are larger and we call them pear patches. 
the plica circularis. These are circular folds of the jejunum. They're larger and closely, longer and closely packed compared to the ones of the ilium, which are shorter, sparsely packed. Now look at the arterial arcades for the ilium. About four to five arterial arcades are present in the ilium. And uh, usually the gap between the vasa recta there will be occupied by a lot of fat. And so it is basically opaque. There are no windows. The vasa recta are shorter, as you can see, compared to this one. In terms of vascularity, they are bigger and more arteries that come to this one, jejunum, compared to the ones that come to this one, ilium. So we say that uh, jejunum is more vascularized, arterial-wise, and that is why it appears deep red compared to ilium that will be pale pink. I believe we've uh, captured the other differences as well between the jejunum and the ilium. So this image shows you the peritoneum. I think you can now see that peritoneum nicely that suspended the small bowel. And now the blood vessels run within the peritoneum. Now, before we finish on the story of the small bowel or the small intestine, let's say something about neuronal control of the gut functions. The nervous system controls the functions of the JT or function of the gut, and the nervous system that controls the function of the JT is the enteric nervous system. Enteric nervous system consists of submucosal plexus of nerves, which is within the submucosa of the JT. These ones control JT secretions. The submucosal plexus are also called the plexus of Meisner's, Meisner's plexus. Then you have the myenteric plexus or the Auerbach plexus. This myenteric plexus control peristalsis. They are located within the muscular layer of the JT wall. They are both controlled, sorry. So these are the nerves, my enteric plexus within the muscular wall and uh, the submucosal plexus within the submucosa. We can see in this image, the myenteric plexus will be slightly deeper compared to the submucosal plexus. Look at it from the distance from the mucosal surface. Even though there are two plexuses, they're both regulated by sympathetic and parasympathetic divisions of the nervous system. And I don't know whether you had a lecture on the autonomic nervous system, but basically, autonomic nervous system consists of two systems, sympathetic and parasympathetic systems, and they have different effects on the JT. For example, the nerve responsible for parasympathetic effects on the gut is the vagus nerve. The nerves responsible for sympathetic effects on the gut are called splanchnic nerves. Vagus nerve is the 10th cranial nerve. The splanchnic nerves are thoracic nerves which go to the abdomen to supply the abdominal viscera. In terms of peristaltis, sympathetic will inhibit peristaltis while parasympathetic increases peristaltic activity. In terms of sphincter tones, parasympathetic tend to relax the sphincters of the JT like pyloric sphincter and enosphincter, while sympathetic tend to make those sphincter contract so that the tone is increased. In terms of uh, consistency of stool, if you compare these two, increased movement and uh, open sphincters, it means that the stool that come out will be watery stool. But uh, on the other end, if there are no contractions, which means no movements in, along the wall and uh, the sphincters are tight, it means that when the stool comes out, it's hard. In terms of salivation, I've just put this one for the sake of completion, not necessarily related to the intestines. In terms of the type of saliva produced, parasympathetic help you to produce cupias, uh, watery saliva, a lot of watery saliva, while sympathetic help to stimulate mucoid saliva. In terms of gastric acid, parasympathetic stimulates 
acid production of the stomach, while sympathetic decreases acid production of the stomach. We can now talk about endocrine secretions of the small intestine, but basically these endocrine secretions are also related to those ones coming from the stomach. So we'll combine them together. Maybe just to take a note that uh, there's a wide variety of chemical messengers which are secreted by either the nerve terminals of the enteric nervous system, the submucosal plexus basically, as well as the epithelium that line the JT wall. The major sites where the hormones are produced are stomach, duodenum, and jejunum, but even the colon can also participate in hormonal production. There are many cell types which have been identified to produce hormones. We generally call them the enteroendocrine cells, as I've mentioned in a few minutes ago, or neuroendocrine cells. So many of them have been identified. Well, there are others like called enterochromaffin cells, which produce serotonin, and uh, enterochromaffin like cells, which produce histamine. But the others are called enteroendocrine cells. There are many types. It is believed that, uh, okay, it is known that these chemicals are primarily paracrine, which means they affect neighborhood cells. However, they're occasionally found in the bloodstream, and that is why we consider them hormonal as well. They're part of what we call the diffuse neuroendocrine system, which means a system of cells stimulated by the nervous system to, to produce hormones. It is believed that if you are to bring all these neuroendocrine cells together, they may actually form the largest endocrine organ in the body. But they are scattered, they're diffused, they're scattered all over. If you are to just bring the, all of them together, they perhaps make the largest endocrine organ in the body. And that will encompass the endocrine cells in the pancreas, in the stomach, and the, in the intestines. Sometimes it's referred to as the gastropancreatical intestinal organ for that particular reason. Now we'll mention some hormones which come from those cells and will state their functions. Gastrin is one of the hormones. Gastrin is produced by the G cells. G cells are present in the stomach as well as in the duodenum. The function of gastrin is to stimulate gastric acid production as well as uh, stimulation of pepsin secretion. Remember pepsinogen is the one that become converted to pepsin. Other than that, gastrin also stimulates uh, regeneration of the epithelium of the stomach as well as that of the intestines. Cholecystokinin, normally called CCK, come from the eye cells of the duodenum and jejunum. Cholecystokinin has a number of functions, but importantly, it produces, uh, or rather, it stimulates pancreatic enzyme secretion as well as bicarbonate secretion from the pancreas. So it stimulates exocrine pancreas to produce its pancreatic juice, basically. Other than that one, it also stimulates contraction of the gallbladder, and that is why it's called cholecystokinin. And it also causes relaxation of the sphincter of OD, and that will promote emptying of pancreatic secretions into the duodenum. Secretin come from the S cells of the duodenum and jejunum. As the name suggests, secretin increases the secretions of the pancreatic asina as well as secretions of the biliary tree, both in volume as well as the bicarbonate content, the alkaline content of the secretions. And uh, secretin inhibits gastric acid secretion. Then we have gastric inhibitory peptide, which come from the K cells of the duodenum and jejunum. It was called so because it was noted that that particular hormone inhibits the pancreas, sorry, it inhibits the stomach gastric motility. However, that is not the primary function and it has been seen that actually that function 
is largely when you have uh, high levels of this particular chemical that was experimental. Within its physiological levels, GIP stimulate insulin secretion. And for that reason, it is also called glucose dependent insulotropic polypeptide. We have motilin. Motilin come from the MO cells. MO cells are present in the stomach, small intestine, as well as colon in this particular case. Motilin regulates the migratory motor complexes that control gastrointestinal motility between meals. Usually, after you've taken a meal, after a few minutes or hours, there'll be some movement along the JT. Motilin is the one that controls those ones. When you're eating during mealtime, the secretion of motilin is actually inhibited. But between meals, that is when those MMCs actually come to play. So motilin is the one that controls those ones. Somatostatin come from the D cells. Remember, D cells are present in the pancreas, but they're also present along the mucosa of the GIT. Somatostatin inhibits the secretion of gastric acid, gastrin, gastric inhibitory peptide, secretin, motilin, and even the pancreatic exocrine secretion itself. It also inhibits gastric motility, gallbladder contraction, and absorption of some food like uh, glucose and amino acids. So these are just examples of hormones which are produced by the small bowel or rather hormones which are produced by the gut with different functions, but this is not the only list. I've told you that we have over 15 different cell types. Now let's talk about structural adaptations of the small intestines to its key functions. We've seen that the key function, or let's say that the key function, the small intestine is it is the site, the primary site of digestion of food. That's why you're seeing a lot of enzymes and secretions from the pancreas going to the small intestine. It's the primary site of digestion of food that largely occurs in the duodenum and jejunum. But the small intestine is also the primary site of absorption of nutrients. And that occurs largely again in the jejunum as well as ileum. So because of that, the small intestine will be having several adaptations. One of them is very long to increase the surface area. Also, it's highly coiled. The coiling here is not really to increase surface area, but to slow down food so that you increase contact time. The presence of villi increase the surface area. The presence of microvilli increase the surface area. The muscular wall help in contraction so that we facilitate movement along the coiling so they don't have just have stasis totally. There's a rich capillary network, especially within the core of the villi, which promote absorption of substances. There's also an extensive lacteal system. The lacteal system referred to lymphatic channels, which are at the core of the villi. And this one also promote absorption of fat. The epithelium is thin. Remember, it's simple epithelium. So this forms a thin barrier for absorption. The presence of crypts of Libacun are important according to the functions of the crypts of Libacun. Others being basically secretions that aid in absorption as well as for immune functions and regeneration. The plica circularis are the circular folds along the wall of the small bowel or other small intestine. And this plica circularis also increase the surface area for different functions. Great, so that's the story of the adaptations of the small intestine. One last thing about the small intestine is the arterial blood supply. This image captures the blood supply to the small intestine. So the small intestine is supplied by branches of the celiac trunk as well as branches of the superior mesentery artery. Now, starting with the duodenum, the duodenum is supplied by both, actually. The arteries that supply the duodenum are called the pancreatic duodenal arteries. 
the superior pancreatic duodenal artery is eventually from the celiac trunk. The inferior pancreatic duodenal artery is eventually from the, inferior, the superior mesenteric artery. That tells you something about the embryonic origin of the duodenum. We are going to state it when you look at the development and malformations of the GIT. Jejunum and ileum are supplied by corresponding branches from the superior mesenteric artery. So we have jejunal arteries or jejunal branches of the SMA, and we have ileal branches of the SMA as well. Good. Now we're done with the small intestine. Let's now talk about the large intestine. The large intestines extend from the ileocecal valve to the level of the anus. It's largely located around the loops of the small bowel. As you can see in that particular image, we mentioned that the large bowel is peripheral. The large bowel is approximately 1.5 meters long in adults. So it's shorter than the small bowel, which is at about five meters. The caliber of the large bowel usually diminishes this way. So it's la large at the cecum and uh, going that way, the caliber is diminishing perhaps at around there. So that from the sigma, so the, the, the bowel caliber is smallest at the descending colon. Then it begins again to widen at the sigmoid colon and again wide at the rectum. In terms of the components of the large bowel or large intestine, we have the cecum, which is that one. Attached to the cecum is that one, the vermiform appendix. We also have the colon, and remember that there are different segments of the colon, the ascending colon, hepatic flexure, also called the right colic flexure, the transverse colon, the splenic flexure, which is also called the left colic flexure, the descending colon, and the sigmoid colon. Out of those, the ascending colon and the descending colon are fixed. They are retroperitoneal. They don't have a mesentery. The transverse colon and the sigmoid colon have mesocolon, transverse mesocolon and sigmoid mesocolon. So they are intraperitoneal. Then down there, we have the rectum, which is very wide, and the anus. The anus consists of two sphincters, the internal sphincter, which is smooth muscle, and the external sphincter, which is skeletal muscle. In terms of external appearance that is unique to the large intestine, we have the tinea coli, which are bands of smooth muscle. The longitudinal layer of muscle exists in bands. There are three of them. We call them the tinea coli, very unique to the colon or large bowel. Then you have hostrations. Hostrations are believed to come about because the colon itself is longer than the tinea coli. And so the colon must fold to form those circulations. We call them circulations or hostrations. So this is the tinea coli, a band, and this is the circulation. From inside, if you look at it from inside, you see these projections from inside. Those are the circulations. Then externally, the large bowel also has what we call appendices epiploci. When you talk of appendices epiploci, we're referring to fat tags. These are the fat tags which are attached to the large bowel. Or these ones here. Closely related to the tinea coli though. So there are more that are present in the large bowel. We didn't talk about them in the small bowel. So while we are there, I want you to think through the anatomical differences between the small bowel 
and the large bowel. Think about them. Anatomical differences between the small bowel and the large bowel. Now, in terms of histological structure, the large bowel resembles the small bowel in a number of ways, except that uh, the large bowel does not have the villi, and also the plica circularis, or what we call the circular folds, are absent in the large bowel. And importantly, the crypts of Lebacun are longer in the large bowel compared to the small bowel. So this is just histological. There are more goblet cells in the large bowel than in the small bowel. And remember, the large bowel has the tinea coli, which you don't have in the small bowel. So those are just histological unique differences, but uh, the, what I've asked you, gross anatomical differences, uh, I hope that uh, you can pick them up. In terms of blood supply to the large bowel, the right side of the large bowel receive blood supply from branches of the superior mesenteric artery. So we have uh, that artery there that give you branches that supply the cecum, the appendix. We call that artery the iliocolic artery that supply the cecum, so supply the appendix and uh, some part of the ascending column. Then you have the right colic artery that supply a big part of the ascending colon. We have middle colic artery, which supply a big part of the transverse colon. Then inferior mesenteric artery supplies the left side of the large bowel via different branches. The left colic artery supplying the ascending colon. The left colic, middle colic, and the right colic form an anastomosis which we call the marginal artery of Drummond. Other than the marginal artery of Drummond, we also have some branches from the inferior mesenteric artery that still go to the sigmoid colon. So those are the sigmoidal branches and also goes to the upper part of the rectum. That artery is called the superior rectal artery. The veins that drain the large bowel will follow the same pattern and go via the inferior mesenteric vein and superior mesenteric vein. The inferior mesenteric vein joins the superior mesenteric vein and the superior mesenteric vein joins the splenic vein to form the portal vein, which goes to the liver. Okay. Now I want us to do something practical. I want you to be able to identify some segments of the JT according to the histological slides that I'll be giving you. And this is a time I'll be expecting responses from you. So we'll be using the chat for the responses and I want it to be quick so that we can do it quickly. Before that, uh, maybe just to remind you that if you want to identify a segment of the JT wall, there are some things that can guide you. We did this in the previous class, but let me just repeat them. You can rely on the type of the epithelium. So look at the type of epithelium. When you are at the level of the intestine, remember this epithelium is simple columnar. Also at the level of the large intestine, simple columnar. So maybe the epithelial type will not help us to distinguish different parts of the intestine, but will help you to distinguish parts which are not of the intestine, like esophagus and the like. Well, the enas will be unique because it will be lined by stratified squamous. The type of mucosal folds present will also help you remember that uh, the small intestine has the circular folds, which we call the valvuli conventis or plica circularis. Valvuli conventis or plica circularis. The presence and amount of the goblet cells will also help you remember the number of goblet cells increase as you go down. The presence of microvilli will help in identifying the regions which are absorptive 
the presence of mucosal glands will also help you, but this one is largely distinguishing stomach from the other parts. Remember the intestine will just be having the crypts of Libacon. Presence and amount of malt will help you to distinguish ileum from the rest of the other segments of the small bowel or other segments of the intestine. How about in the submucosa? The presence of submucosal glands of Bruna will help you to pick the duodenum different from any other part of the intestine. And in the muscularis propria layer, all of them are of smooth muscle fine and uh, the volume may not matter much unless it's a region of a sphincter. The number of muscle layers will also not matter much if you are in the region of the intestines only, but that helps you to distinguish what is, uh, if, if it is on the stomach, we'll be able to see three layers instead of two. Importantly, however, the outer longitudinal layer will help you to distinguish the colon from the other parts of the intestines. Then also look at the amount of mucus, which is in the lumen. If the amount of mucus in the lumen is more, then that tells you in the lower parts of the gut as opposed to the upper parts of the gut. So I want you to use those parameters to help you identify the parts of the intestines I'm going to show you. That is slide number one. It's a single plate, just mean that one. And this one, I've already shown it to you, so I'll skip it. This one is just showing you the villi. Point to note, when you see villi, you know you're looking at small intestine. If a region does not have villi, it is not small intestine. If a region has villi, it is small intestine. Slide number two. This is showing you something in the lumen. You can see mucus in the lumen. So we know that we are looking at a region which are on the lower part of the JT. Also look at the number of goblet cells. This is what we call many. So there are a lot of goblet cells. Again, confirming to you that you are most likely on the lower parts of the gut as opposed to the proximal parts of the intestines. So this is very unique to the colonic mucosa. This is how the colonic mucosa look like. We have a number of goblet cells that line the crypts of Libacon. These are the crypts of Libacon, very long crypts of Libacon, as you can see, and predominantly lined by goblet cells with a lot of thick mucus plaque within the lumen. Okay, so now this is where I expect you to start giving me your choices and uh, you'll use the chart to just identify the parts of the JT that I'll be displaying to you. So this is a lower magnification. That is what you see at lower magnification. I'm giving you time to see it. Now I'm on the second magnification. So this is the mucosa, submucosa, muscularis propria, inner circular outer longitudinal layer. Third magnification showing you in the mucosal layer and the submucosal layer. Okay, so let me call that question one. Okay, question three. I want you people to identify that one. Which part of the alimentary canal is this one I've given you? Okay, carry on. I want you people to answer in the chat. Okay, good. Most people have indicated duodenum, and that is very true. You can see, maybe I take it to that magnification 
So you see Villa's projections telling you that you are in the small in the small intestine. Then you see submucosal glands, and that is a giveaway for the duodenum. Okay, slide number four. So I'm calling it question four. It's a single plate, and that is how it looks like. Which part of the GIT will this be? Use the chat to answer. Okay, carry on, carry on. Okay, I close it there. So I've checked, uh, we have uh, about 20 responses and nobody has gotten it right. So look, the lumen is there. We can see many projections into the lumen. These are villi telling us that this is small intestine. So we're debating between duodenum, jejunum or ileum. Look at this region here. There are several glands within the submucosa before the muscular is proprium. That makes us single it out as duodenum. So that is still duodenum. Okay, slide number five. Single slide. Which part of the JT would this be? You have 30 seconds or less to write your response. Okay. The chat is uh, now enabled for you. You can write your responses now. Okay, I'll close it there. So most of you have gotten it right. It is either jejunum or ileum, but definitely not duodenum and definitely not anything in the large bowel because we can see villi, but we don't see submucosal glands. Slide number six. So this is a longitudinal section through the bowel, longitudinal as opposed to cross-sectional. That means that this is the outer longitudinal layer of muscle and this is the inner circular layer of muscle. This is submucosa. The blue region is submucosa. And so this is the mucosa. Okay, with that in mind, write for me your thoughts on slide six. Which part of the JT would this be? I have that magnification and uh, a higher magnification, which is that one. So you are debating between those two that one and the previous one to make your verdict. I'll leave it at the lower magnification because it's better 
but remember that the higher magnification of it. Okay, write your comments on the chat. So it's enabled for you. Okay, I'll close it there. So 50% of you gotten it right and 50% missed it. These ones are the circular folds of the small bowel, telling you that this is small bowel. Well, the other evidence that tells you that this is small bowel is uh, this one, the villi, look at them. There are very many villi, that's villi, that's another villi. So there are many villi here. And then let me take that lower multiplication. So remember I've told you these are longitudinal section. So the circular folds will appear like this. There are folds of the submucosa which, is, which are translated onto the mucosa. Now these folds are very long and very close together, very characteristic of the jejunum. Remember I told you the plica circularis are longer, larger, and closely packed in the jejunum. Okay, slide number eight. Again, a longitudinal section. We can confirm that uh, we can see the villi, so it's small intestine. We can confirm that we see the plica circularis. These ones are relatively spaced out compared to what you've seen in the previous one. So that is one, that's another one. There's a space there and that's another one. So we can make a guess that uh, most likely we are looking at either the ileum or the duodenum, but uh, then look at the submucosa, there are no glands. So that makes this one the ileum. And what do you notice there? That is a mucosa associated lymphatic tissue characteristic of the ileum. Very many in the ileum, that's one of them. Look at the epithelium of the ileum at a high modification. You see a brush border telling you that this is absorptive epithelium. So that is ileum. I've given you that one. Okay, it's still the same modification showing you the villas projections. Okay, now try this one. Number nine. Which part of the GIT will this be? I have three magnifications there. I want to show you all of them. So this is the lowest magnification. That is what you see. Again, still longitudinal section through the intestines. And that is the second level magnification. And I think I can leave it there, those two magnifications. Which part of the alimentary canal will this one be? Okay, the answers are coming. So far, so good. Okay. So I've seen responses, about 20. And uh, two people have gotten it wrong. The others have gotten it right. It is the ileum, based on what we just said. At high magnification, again, you can appreciate the brush border of the ileum there. All right, this one might be a bit hard for you, but uh, give it a try. Which part of the 
Bowel is this one. Before I tell it to you. So that is question 10. It's just a single plate like that. So, okay, can guide you. Only, only five people have gotten it right. But I'm impressed that there are people gotten it right anyway. So this is still ilium because we can see the villas projections on that region. It is small intestine because the present the villas projections. And then you can see these ones. These are the pairs patches several large lymphatic aggregations, pairs patches. And look at that one. This is mesentery, the attachment to the mesentery. So whatever organ we're looking at is intraperitoneal. This is ilium still. Compare that one with the one I'm showing you right now. So I'll show you the previous one. I want to compare that one, slide number 10, with that one, slide number 11. It's a single slide there. Give me your thoughts. This slide number 11, where is it from? Carry on, write, write something. Only four people have responded so far. I'm about to close it. Okay, I'll close it there. I have uh, 15 responses and uh, two people have gotten it right. This one is the appendix. So how do you use the appendix? The appendix also has a lot of lymphoid aggregations, as you can see there. But the appendix does not have the villi. So there are no villi. So the presence of several lymphoid aggregations and the absence of the villi make this one the appendix and not the ilium. Okay, another one. I have about 16 slides, so don't worry. We're almost done with them. That's number 12. What do you think? Which part of the jet is that one? So I have three levels of magnification. This is the lower level. That is the middle level of magnification. And uh, that is the highest magnification I'm giving you on the mucosa. So I'll take it back to the lowest magnification. Write down what you think. That is the highest, that's middle, and that's lower. Okay, this one is straightforward. Most of you have gotten it right. I'm, however, surprised that some people have still gotten it wrong. I think you've forgotten something I've just shown you a few minutes ago. But okay, that's how some people learn. So you can see three bands 
of the longitudinal muscle telling you that this is tinea coli. So we're looking at this slide of the colon, confirm there that is uh, tinea coli. And uh, a few minutes ago, I just shown you how the epithelium of the colon looks like. Very long clips of Libacun, very close together, and the clips of Libacun lined by several goblet cells. This one is a single slide. I'm using this to show you the mucosa of the rectum. Very thick mucus secretion within the lumen. Several goblet cells. This is how the mucosa of the rectum looks like. So I've taken 13 and I'll give you 14. So question 14, I have three magnifications. The lowest magnification is that one. So look at the folds. Remember it's a cross section, those are the folds. This is the muscular layer in a circular outer longitudinal. This is the submucosa. This is the mucosa. And in the mucosa, that is the outline of the mucosa. Okay, write down which part of the JT would this be? Carry on, carry on. Okay, you fear this one seemingly. Uh, 10 people have responded. We can work with that. Now I have 15. Out of the 15, only one got it right. So maybe it's a hard one. Let's look at it from here. So we have a cross section. And you're seeing some folds cut in that manner. It means that these folds are running longitudinally. The only parts of the JT with longitudinal folds are esophagus and the rectum. To distinguish the two, we then look at the high magnification of it so that we look at the type of epithelium. So the epithelial type is simple columnar. We can see several goblet cells and we can see very thick mucus plaque within the lumen. This is rectum. It is not esophagus. If it was esophagus, we'll see stratified squamous non-creatinous epithelium. There are no mucus in the lumen. But also pick this. In the submucosa of this esophagus, we expect some glands. Here, we don't have glands. So that is still the slide of the rectum. All right. Now we can finish with the last part of the lecture. So this will be quick. We are going to describe the splanchnic circulation and highlight on the portocable anastomosis and its clinical relevance. So this is splanchnic circulation, blood flow to the digestive system is what you call the splanchnic circulation. From the aorta, there are three arteries that go to the digestive system. We have the celiac artery, the superior mesenteric artery, and the inferior mesenteric artery. These three arteries are branches of the abdominal aorta. They are territorial. Celiac artery supplies the derivatives of the four guts. 
superior mesenteric supplies derivatives of the mid gut. Inferior mesenteric supply derivatives of the hind gut. The junction between the foregut and the mid gut is a duodenum. And the junction between the mid gut and the hind gut is a transverse colon. Therefore, we will expect duodenum to be supplied by both cilia, branches of cilia cutary and SMA. And you'll expect the transverse colon to sub, be supplied by branches of SMA and IMA. Cilia cutary, in addition to supplying the foregut, the whole OGIT, it also supplies other organs of the digestive system derived from the foregut, like the liver, the pancreas, and uh, related to that one also the spleen. And that is why you're seeing that kind of distribution of the celiac artery. Now, wherever the arteries go to, remember they'll be supplying different organs there. Let's consider the ones that go to the intestines. They supply the intestine. So there'll be a capillary plexus within the intestinal wall eventually. From the capillary plexus, you have veins. The veins which come from the intestines, superior mesenteric vein, inferior mesenteric vein, and the veins related to the blood supply to the stomach, like left gastric vein, right gastric vein, and the like. They all join together with the vein from the spleen to form what we call the portal vein. So the gut veins and the splenic vein join to form the portal vein. Therefore, portal vein carry the oxygenated blood from the digestive system. The blood in the portal vein goes to the liver. That blood is deoxygenated, but it's going to the liver. That means that it can't be the only source of blood supply to the liver. So in addition to that, the liver also receives blood supply from a branch of the celiac artery, which we call the hepatic artery. This is what delivers oxygen to the liver. Therefore, we can say that the liver has two sources of blood supply. The port of vein, which delivers nutrient rich blood to the liver, the nutrients having come from the intestines and hepatic artery, which delivers oxygen rich blood to the liver. The hepatic artery is responsible for about 20% of blood supply to the liver. We can say 20 to 25% of blood supply to the liver while portal vein is responsible for about 75 to 80% of blood supply to the liver. The two circulations, one with oxygen and the other one with the nutrients, both mix within the capillaries in the liver. The capillaries in the liver are sinusoidal capillaries. So they all mix in the liver sinusoids. And from the liver sinusoids, we have veins. Standardly, we have conventional, we have three veins which drain the liver, the right hepatic vein, middle hepatic vein, and left hepatic vein. These three hepatic veins drain the liver and take blood from the liver all the way to the inferior vena cava. So that is the splanchnic circulation. Now, based on that, there's what we call portocaval anastomosis. Portocaval anastomosis, which is also called portosystemic anastomosis, refer to connections of veins. Anastomosis is a connection of vascular channels. In this case, it's anastomosis of veins. Veins of the portal circulation, which means the blood that passes through the liver, and veins of the systemic circulation, the veins that take blood to the vena cava without passing through the liver. Now get that right first. By understanding what is the meaning of portal, when you use the term portal system, it refers to the existence of two capillary beds within one cardiovascular circuit. Think about the normal cardiovascular circuit. 
we have uh, the heart giving you arteries, then arterioles, then capillaries, then venules, then veins back to the heart. That's the normal, the conventional cardiovascular circuit that we know. A portal system has two capillary beds in one circuit, which means from the heart you have arteries, then arterioles, then capillaries within an organ. Then there's vascular channel that connect that capillary bed and another capillary bed. For example, here, blood from the heart go to the outer arteries, then those three arteries of the gut, then capillary plexus within the intestines. From the intestines, you have the portal vein, vascular channel that connect the intestines to the liver. Then in the liver, you have another capillary bed before the blood goes back to the heart. So the existence of two capillary beds is what we call a portal system. And so we are saying that portocaval anastomosis or portal systemic anastomosis refer to the connection between the vessels which go to the liver and the vessels which do not go to the liver. Why are we saying it's an important thing to talk about here? It's important to talk about it because in cases where blood in the liver cannot find its way back to the inferior vena cava, maybe the hepatic veins are blocked, sites of portosystemic anastomosis provide a collateral channel via which blood that was supposed to pass through the liver can still go to the heart without passing through the liver to the inferior vena cava. There are a number of sites with portocaval or portosystemic anastomosis. And I'll give you those sites, but I'll also give you the clinical implications of the same, that in cases of portal hypertension, which is what happened when you have blockage of the portal circulation, those sites of portosystemic anastomosis may open up, the capillaries will dilate and gorge so that they can allow blood flow in the reverse to other regions. And that will give us different clinical entities. So one of the sites of portocaval anastomosis is the lower part of the esophagus. Why do we say so? The lower part of the esophagus is drained by the left gastric vein, which can take blood to the liver, so it is portal. But it's also drained by the azygous vein. The esophageal veins join the azygous venous system which take blood to the superior vena cava. So that is a systemic vessel. In cases of portal hypertension, the vessels around the low esophagus will therefore dilate. And that is what we call esophageal varices. These ones usually present with bleeding. So there'll be pain and also bleeding when these patients swallow, they feel a lot of pain and they can even vomit. When this capillary is ruptured, they can even vomit blood. Another site is the anterior abdominal wall. Why do we say it's portocaval anastomotic site? Because we have some veins which come from the anterior abdominal wall, pass through some veins around the ligamentum teres of the liver, taking blood all the way to the liver. So those ones are considered portal. But again, on the anterior abdominal wall, we have the superior and the inferior epigastric veins which take blood to superior and inferior vena cava respectively. So they're systemic. If blood, if there is portal hypertension, you'll have reversal of blood flow in the veins around ligamentum teres all the way to the anterior abdominal wall. In that case, the blood vessels from the anterior abdominal wall will be radiating away from the umbilicus, giving us the appearance of what is commonly called the caput medusa. Third site is the rectum. Rectum is drained by the superior rectal vein, which goes to the inferior mesenteric vein. So it is portal. And we have the middle and inferior rectal vein, which take blood to the internal pudendal vessels, which is basically systemic. That one will eventually go to the inferior vena cava. If you have portal hypertension, this vessel is also dilate and uh, we call that an rectal varices. Another site is the region around the spleen. 
the splenic vein anastomosis with the branches from the tributaries of the renal vein and tributaries of the suprarenal vein. The left renal vein, left suprarenal vein, there could be other veins around there like gonadal that could also still anastomose the splenic vein. In case of portal hypertension, usually there's a connection between those vessels, which is very prominent. We call that splenorenal shunt. Lastly, we can talk about the retroperitoneum. And in this case, we are thinking about the duodenum, pancreas, ascending colon, and descending colon. The veins from those regions would be draining them. So they could be the veins related to the tributaries of the superior mesenteric that would apply for duodenum, pancreas, and uh, ascending colon, or the veins related to the tributaries of the inferior mesenteric that will apply to the descending colon. Those ones are portal. But those regions could also be drained by the veins that drain the posterior abdominal wall, which are lumbar veins, and that is systemic. So it was a site of portal systemic anastomosis. We may not have a clinical entity to that effect. Great, now we are done with the second part of the lecture on the anatomy of the digestive system. Our next class will be on anatomy of the extensic organs of the digestive system. So I know I've stretched you, but uh, we're done now, we'll stop there.